My name is Janina Romero, and I'm a second year student at the Center for Latin American Studies. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the third edition of the Georgetown University Latin American Conference on Extractive Industries, Opportunities, Challenges, and the Way Forward. Thank you for coming. The fact that many of you travel long distances serves to remind us our commitment to Latin American's development. We are fortunate to have the tremendous support of the Center for Latin American Studies, the Latin American Initiative, and the Latin American Leadership Program for this conference. But I would like to give a special thank you to all the student organizations that work very hard to make this happen. Latin American Policy Association, the Georgetown Chapter of Port Colombia, the Latin American Council, and Georgetown University Graduate Association of Mexican Students. Extractive industries are essential components of Latin American economies. When projects are well implemented, set the rights of locals as a priority, and the financial benefits are responsibly managed, extractive industries can contribute to sustainable development and economic progress. However, they can also represent a challenge to human development and exacerbate many of the region's existing ills. In recent decades, the importance of extractive industries in Latin America and the Caribbean has increased. With countries seeking to provide a stable investment climate through predictable legal and regulatory framework and competitive tax regimes limiting taxes on private companies. This has accelerated rates of economic growth, but unfortunately, it has also been accompanied in some cases by significant levels of corruption, social conflicts, and environmental damage. In some cases, undermining democracy and the human rights of many citizens across people in the region. How can governments balance the seemingly contradictory goals of investment promotion, local human development in contrast to national development, and in turn, responsibly regulate the industries that extract the resources? How can a favorable investment business environment be created without sacrificing long-term national interests or jeopardizing local goals and rights? This conference aims to bring together researchers and practitioners from across the region to help us discuss these difficult yet poignant questions. Hence, taking the lead from the Latin American Studies Association's call for a dialogue of knowledge, the conference aims to include the different voices of the region. I would like to hand the microphone now to Dr. Angelo Rivero Santos, Academic Director of the Center for Latin American Studies, who is going to say a few words on behalf of the center. Also, please, I would like to remind you to turn off your phones. Buenos dias. Bon dia. Good morning. Uh, I have to say this is one of the favorite events of the year, only because it is by students, for students, and for the whole community. I congratulate all of our students who are putting this together. And um, I would like to thank uh, all of you, the student groups, uh, for leading you know, this talented group of guests and student organizations in designing and carrying out this important conference. Felicidades a todos en realidad por un trabajo muy bien hecho. I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of our director, Father Matthew Carnes, uh, our staff, our faculty, some of whom will be panelists today. Ramon Espinaza is here today uh, as part of the first panel, as is Camille. I see Camille somewhere. But most importantly, I would like to uh, welcome you on behalf of our students in the master's program the graduate certificate and the undergraduate certificate in Latin American studies. You know that a topic is important when you have eight student organizations, graduate and undergraduate, from at least five different schools on our campus that are interested in Latin America and the Caribbean, and they all agree we should be talking about extractive industries. So that agreement, if you have been to our classrooms, is rare because we promote debate. And the fact that these eight organizations decided that this was the topic of this year's conference gives you an idea of the importance of extractive industries in this hemisphere. 
I would especially like to welcome to Georgetown those of you that have come from afar or from just down the street in downtown uh, to be with us in our campus. And I would like to thank all the panelists that have agreed to participate in today's event. But most importantly, I would like to thank you for supporting our students over the past few months as they put this conference together. As Janina indicated, and as our, uh, the concept paper you presented to the panelists that I have read indicates, uh, Executive, uh, extractive industries have historically been a source of opportunities for economic growth in Latin America and the Caribbean. But as Janina indicates, they have also <coughs> brought about many social, political, and environmental challenges that affect the lives of millions of our people, particularly the most vulnerable sectors of our populations. As you know, there have been a historic call from many citizens in the region for natural resources to be managed responsibly and be managed for the benefit of all. There is no question that development models in many countries in the region have promoted and prioritized economic growth above many other dimensions of development, including equity, social justice, environmental sustainability, and respects for human rights. The growth of the world economy over the past years has also exerted pressure on natural resources and hence provided an opportunity for natural resource rich countries to take advantage of this expansion. This, of course, as all of us know, as students of Latin America and the Caribbean, is not new to our region. The exploitation of natural resources has a long tradition in this hemisphere, dating back to the time of colonization. And in our Republican life of the past almost two centuries now, that exploitation has also been a source of opportunities, no doubt, but also the source of conflicts that have impacted our efforts to create inclusionary and unitary nation states. Since the 1990s, the increase in foreign investment in extractive industries have brought many more companies from all over the world to the region, as well as many banks and multilateral institutions that have facilitated their operations through different means like export credits, investment guarantees, and financing of mining operations. These developments have brought about an intense debate, not only in our classrooms, in the <coughs> literature, but also in our societies, about the role these companies play in development, about the role the state should play in development, about the role organized civil society should play in the process of expansion of these industries. And it has brought, once again, a continued interest in two historic questions that we in development and political economy often ask. The first question is, what kind of benefits do these industries bring to the welfare of most citizens in the hemisphere? And two, how can benefits accruing from resource extraction be used to implement more inclusionary, more pro-poor development strategies? How can they be used to promote equity and make up for the social and ecological debt that that extract extraction has brought about? These questions are directly related to the work we do at the Center for Latin American Studies right here in the School of Foreign Service. Our teaching and our research, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels, expose our students to these complexities. And as many of our graduates, some of whom are here today, have found out 
this multidisciplinary approach to the study of Latin America and the Caribbean, combined with a rigorous academic training, prepares them well to compete in this competitive world of international affairs and particularly Western Hemispheric affairs. Let me stop here and again say thank you, obrigado, gracias, to our student groups, to our panelists, to the organizers of the conference, and to all of you for being here. Bienvenidos. Sandra Torres and I'm a first year MPP student at the McCord School of Public Policy. To get started, let me introduce you to our first panel, Promises and Dilemmas of Oil and Mining Industries. First, I'm going to introduce Lisa Wee. Lisa first joined Chevron in 2010 as an advisor to the Global Issues and Public Policy team in Washington, D.C. to support work on human rights, partnerships, and sustainability reporting. In more recent years, she has provided technical assistance to Chevron's business units on community engagement, social investment, and social impact management. Before <coughs> joining Chevron, she worked for a think tank in Washington, D.C., and several social enterprises in Latin America. She has experience working in Paraguay, Argentina, Mexico, Peru, Angola, Bangladesh, and France. In addition to holding a BA from the University of Oxford in Modern Languages, she has an MA in International Relations and Economics from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, Natasha Nunes da Cunha. Natasha is a consultant at the, at the Inter-American Development Bank, currently responsible for communications and external affairs in extractives. With over 13 years of professional experience, both in the public and private sectors, she has worked with issues management, stakeholder engagement, and social political risk analysis in Latin America. Prior to joining the IDB, she was external affairs manager at Vail, one of the world's largest mining companies. Jorge Calderón Gamboa, current senior coordinating attorney at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and a visiting professor of the Human Rights Master's Program at the UN-mandated University for Peace. In Mexico, Jorge was active in various NGOs and worked on several community projects with indigenous people. He also worked as a deputy visitor at the Human Rights Commission of Mexico City. In 2014, Jorge was appointed by the Mexican government as an independent expert and commentator on the International Protocol on the Documentation and Investigation of Sexual Violence in Conflict in London, England. In 2016, he worked as a visiting lawyer, second jurist, at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, France. He has been a visiting professor of law at the University of Costa Rica, the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights, the University of Lucerne, Santa Clara University, as well as different master's programs in the Americas. He has also lectured in various countries in Europe, Africa, and the Americas. He is author of several articles on international human rights, in particular on indig indigenous people's rights, environmental law, and reparations. Ramon Espinaza, lead oil and gas specialist at the Ener Energy Division of the Inter-American Development Bank. Dr. Espinaza is an industrial engineer from Universidad Católica Andrés Bello in Caracas, Venezuela, and holds degrees of PhD and Master in Energy Economics and Economic Development from the University of Cambridge, and a Master in Economic Development from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. Currently, Dr. Espinaza is adjunct professor at Georgetown University, where he teaches two postgraduate seminars on world and hemispheric energy security. Before his current position, he worked at Petrolos de Venezuela, where he was chief economist between 1992 and 1999. Moderating this first panel is Alejandra Reyes Elizondo. She's a second year MPP student at Georgetown University. 
She earned a BA in International Relations in Mexico's ITAM. She has worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Social Development in Mexico City. Alejandra is currently Vice President of the Latin American Policy Association at Court. She has a particular interest in energy and environmental policies. So, Alejandra. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you to our panelists. Um, just to let the audience know a bit about the format, our panelists are going to present, then I'm going to ask them a few questions, and then I'm going to open up the floor for, for questions from the audience. Um, so let's get started. Natasha, we're going to start with you. Sure. Uh, hi everyone, good morning. Um, I, I want to, since I'm the first, I'm going to set the context of it and, and, and talk more generally about, about, about the topic of this panel and, and what extractives um, mean for Latin America. And, and I think I'll, bit of, I'll build upon what Professor uh, Angelo mentioned in his introduction. So we can start with numbers because that's indisputable. Um, the numbers do indicate that extractive industries, meaning mining, oil, and gas, um, have a very powerful, positive, or can have a very positive, transformative impact for Latin American, um, Latin American and the Caribbean um, uh, socioeconomic progress. The region is um, is a major producer of very important minerals. Um, it produces over half the world's silver, nearly half the copper, between a quarter and a fifth of the tin, bauxite, and gold, as well as other uh, key materials. It holds uh, some of the, of the world's largest known reserves um, of key, mat key materials. Two-thirds of lithium is here in three countries. 45% of the world's copper, uh, almost 25% of the nickel, and over 20% of iron ore. Latin America and the Caribbean receives uh, over a third of the world's investment uh, in mineral exploration, and it is expected or estimated that by 2020, six Latin American countries, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, eh, Brazil, Mexico, and Peru, uh, will receive half of the world's investment in, um, in mining. Uh, it also, as, as, as you know, has important uh, oil reserves and gas reserves. So um, these industries account for about 5% of, of the region's uh, GDP. Uh, that's, that, that, it, it's over 10% in countries like Chile and Peru, and over 70%, I don't know if this is too, the microphone is too high, but, uh, uh, and over 70% in, in, in some Caribbean countries. It's a main source of, of fiscal income, of foreign currency, uh, from 2008 to 2015, it accounted for approximately half of the region's exports. Um, so it is clear that the, at least the potential, if not the realized, uh, macroeconomic benefits are very large, very substantive. And um, apart from that, and, and this is where I think also an, an important um, uh, component of, of, of its potential, of the potential of the industries to generate uh, social economic development is that um, it can spearhead development in, 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 in these natural rich regions by generating um, considerable employment, especially along its value chain. It's not a big source of direct employment. It is not, uh, but it is uh, one of the highest uh, generators indirectly of, of, of indirect em employment. It can stimulate the provision of other goods and services, foster economic linkages, create capacity building opportunities, um, set high social environmental uh, standards, uh, spearhead investments in innovation and technology. The industries are one of the biggest source of, 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 of um, innovation and sophisticated uh, technology. Um, another very um, important uh, part is its, its in investment in or the fostering of investments in infrastructure and associated infrastructure. Um, and all this can, can certainly um, foster important economic linkages and strengthen the value chains uh, around, um, around the industry and make it um, increasingly more responsible, thus setting the stage for more investment and more growth. That said, and, and we're all here because of this, they are important. Um, this, there's generally a lot of a lot of criticism around extractives because of the potential negative social and environmental risks associated with this activity. 
especially by the risks faced by a local community whose livelihood is essentially affected, even if not negatively, it will be affected. So social relations tend to be inherently uh, fraught with complexities. After all, extractives compete uh, for water, land, energy, um, irresponsible practices do occur, accidents happen and they sh cannot happen and should not happen. We've seen recent examples of Barrick in Argentina, San Marco in, in, in Brazil. There's, this is one of the regions with the most, with the, with the largest amount of conflicts, of mining related conflicts, uh, over 200. <laughs> <laughs> Over 200 conflicts were reported last year, affecting more than 300 communities, more than 200 projects. So it's a, it's a, especially, and I think Professor Angela mentioned this, especially in our region, there are very, there are historical, there's a historical legacy that, that, that makes this a very sensitive industry, as, as you all know. And there are also issues at the government level that exacerbate this picture. So um, little or no presence uh, no institutional presence at, in these remote regions where extractive activities occur, um, which make these, which aggravate the vulnerabilities of these communities affected by extractive activity. You have a lack of a lack of um, institutional capacity to to deal properly with these issues, lack of transparency, and inappropriate use uh, and and um, effective use of the of the rents from extractive activities. So this this all you know makes it a very um, makes it an activity that's very prone to resistance and conflict and misperceptions also and miscommunication. That said, it doesn't mean that it's inevitable. Conflicts are not inev inevitable. There are plenty of there's plenty of, of extractive activity being done in with the involvement with the inclusion of local communities and governments and in benefits of countries. Um, and I think I am particularly optimistic coming from the industry and now at, 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 a, at the multilateral level, there have been positive changes. It's just that changes occur very slowly. This is an industry, and I'll speak especially about the mining industry, which is where I have more experience. Uh, the, the pace of change is very slow. There, there needs to be a cultural change in the way that, that the extractives um, are done, especially in the way that the social contract is established and the way the stakeholders relate to each other, but there have been positive changes. You see at the, at the community and, and, and community level at, and with the civil society at large are becoming increasingly more organized in the de defense of their needs and interests um, through legitimate processes, let's, let's not forget. Um, governments are also, have been establishing or strengthening the, the regulations um, to ensure that, that the industry um, comply with the highest standards, especially I think when it when it comes to environmental impacts and the, the way that these impacts are monitored and controlled, uh, companies must adhere to the strict, to very strict uh, um, safeguards, and this is sometimes even for pure uh, profit or economic interest, and because their shareholders are increasingly demanding this. Um, and they've been investing, and, and as I said at the beginning, they do invest in innovation and technology to increase resource efficiency, to reduce risks. They're increasingly more sensitive and, and aware of the need to not just create or obtain the social license to operate, but to maintain it uh, throughout the process. Let's remember that, you know, the, the mining a mine is there for at least 30 years usually. Um, so it's it's a it's a long term activity. So it's not it's not something that you can uh, resolve just when when you get there. Um, we've also been seeing been seeing um, multi stakeholder collaborative processes and initiatives being implemented around the world. That means that there's more and more um, concerted action towards consensus building around a common vision about what the, the what what it is that we want from the extractive sector, what it can do, what it means for social, for inclusive and sustainable development. And I think this is, this is where one of the key is, um, my, at least mining and oil and gas, sure, the extractive industries, they won't cease to exist. We won't stop doing mining, you know, simply for the fact that we need it to build houses, we need it uh, in fertilizers for agriculture, we need it for our beloved 
technological gadgets. We need it for communications. We need it for transportation. <coughs> it's something that's going to go away. Um, if, if, if that's the premise, right, that, that it's here to stay, it, we have to do it right. Uh, it has to be done responsibly. And if we, I think we can, we, if we construct an honest debate around that promise, you at least increase your chances of, of finding or, or looking or, and implementing um, sustainable and, inno and innovative solutions to the, to the critical issues of the sector because there are very various, many critical issues at all levels. It's, it's extremely, it's extremely, um, uh, it's an extremely complex uh, sector. It's very, it's, it, there, are, there are many challenges. Um, there's no, and because of this complexity, there's no one size fits all approach that will just, you know, that can be implemented in, uh, that can be implemented everywhere. The mining industry is as complex and, 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 um, how do I say, and, and huge and diverse industry as they come. You have geological, physical circumstances, um, regulatory conditions and, 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 and environment. Um, the way that the, the way that, that that the operating methods, anyway, they vary from country to country, from region to region. It's it's hugely uh, complex, and um, naturally, the solutions and the and the challenges vary accordingly. Um, so I think in, in, it's very difficult to speak of mining as a whole. So let's not do mining. Like, what kind of mining are you referring to? It's, it's a very complex, so, so there is a need to like a real honest interest in, in getting information in terms of, of, of access to information, transparency, availability, of communicating, of engaging in, 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 in honest dialogue. Am I going to answer? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's happening and there's, um, there's more real interest in a, in a constructive uh, engagement and dialogue and, and debate, like an honest debate around these, these issues, but it takes time um, and change has to occur. Not only, it's very easy, and I come from the industry, so I, I maybe have that, that, that bias. It's not industry's fault or it's not industry's responsibilities. All stakeholders, all groups of stakeholders have their own roles and responsibilities, and they, we have, because of the complexities that I haven't even begun to mention, they um, they have to work. You just have to work together because otherwise, you won't you won't you won't have the necessary cohesion and 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 um, you won't do it in a in a coherent um, coherent way. Uh, but we do understand that extractive industries must be carried out responsibly with the utmost respect for the environment <coughs> and the future generations in mind. Local communities have to be the main beneficiaries or the main recipients of the benefits that the activity generates. Uh, governments have to ensure that the benefits go to local communities. Um, so that's, um, I think, the good news is that 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 change is happening. That this that we are moving forward. It's just we have to go a bit faster because change t tends to tends to be more slow in the industry. But but you were seeing. I think you are seeing there are plenty of opportunities to work together. Uh, there are many emerging, encouraging initiatives in our region um, where mining is being considered or at least uh, uh, being thought of as part of the solution to the water, land, energy nexus conundrum, um, such as the development of shared water infrastructure, dis desalinating plants to, to reduce pressure on, on the use of, of, of water and water scarce uh, Regions, technical, technical increase in investments in technical, technological innovation and research and development uh, for closed water uh, circuit systems, uh, reducing the need for tailing dams, among many other examples. So there are good things being done here. Maybe we, we hear less about those than the, than the bad examples, but that there are a lot. The great majority of the industry. Um, is going in that direction and not the opposite, uh, ever more damaging one that we are historically, we have historically been accustomed to. So I think it's the time now to transition and, and this is where the opportunity lies and I think the, um, there are important actors uh, on this to transition Latin America and the Caribbean's extractive sector from one based on a, 
on the natural competitive uh, advantages of, res of a, a very, very resource rich uh, region towards one that is more complex and that integrates um, that integrates this sector into global value chains and into the, the through knowledge and technological innovation. I think that's important. So thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Um, now we're going to move in some, we're going to hear from Jorge Calderon. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this interesting panel. I guess I was invited here to share uh, some ideas related with human rights-based approach. And so since my practice is at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in San Jose, Costa Rica, I'm going to share uh, some of the relevant or the important jurisprudence on this topic. So let's start saying that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has decided more than 22 cases regarding indigenous community in the Americas over the last 17 years. At least four cases had to do with concessions for the exploitation of natural resources within indigenous territories. Most of them related with logging, mining of minerals, hydrocarbons, oil, etc. Because of the time limits, I will focus on two cases. The Sarayaku versus Ecuador case, which is a decision of 2012, and Kalinian Locono versus Suriname, 2015. In the Sarayaku case, the government had granted a concession for exploitation of hydrocarbons and the exploitation of crude oil in the Amazon region, which was a territory of the Kichwa Sarayaku people. This was a partnership contract with two governmental companies and Petrolera Argentina San Jose, a private company that was after bought by Chevron. The concession was granted over 200,000 hectares, which represents 65% of the indigenous territory. And what happened in this case? The state didn't perform any consultation during any of the phases of the execution of the oil extraction. The state constructed seven heliports, dock roads, planted explosive, specifically pentolite, destroyed caves, water sources, underground rivers, and areas that were highly valued for the Sarayaka culture and worldview. They also lost uh, trees and plants that were valuable for their environment and nutritional sustainability. And specifically, the, the indigenous peoples consider that the explosive affect the ancestors' spirits and the Pachamama, the Mother Earth, in their cos cosmovision. The second case is Kalinya and Locono. In 1958, before Suriname's independence from Netherlands, the state granted a concession to a mining company called Suralco, a subsidiary of the aluminum company of Americas, to extract bauxite in the eastern part of Suriname, which includes the natural reserve of Wana Creek. The concession was granted for 75 years at will and will therefore expire in 2033. In 1997 and 2003, Suralco and later the joint venture known as BHP Billiton Suralco, which is Australian and, and British company, took over mining exploitation in one Creek natural reserve over an area of 140 hectares. A highway was built to access the mine and transport the bauxite. This led to the legal and illegal logging activities, hoshing, and the mining of sand, gravel, and Kalin. Also, the indigenous people in the region were forbidden to enter the area of the concession and to hunt and fish. It was just until 2005, eight years after the operation began, that an environmental analysis was performed by the private consultant hired by BHP. Even though this study recommend concluding the operation as soon as possible 
and, rem and remediating the damage caused by the open cast mining operations within the natural reserve. The operation didn't conclude until 2009, after 12 years of the exploitation. As a consequence, this operation caused environmental degradation and disrupt hunting and fishing activities for the community. Reforestation was attempted by the company in some areas without real success. Actually, I had the opportunity to visit to, to, with a delegation of the Inter-American Court to do an on-site visit. And we observed that the landscape had been radically altered in the areas that had been explored. So what are the important standards related with those uh, both two cases? So first of all, the court has held that Article 21 of the American Convention of Human Rights, which recognizes the collective property right, doesn't prevent the state from issuing concessions for the explore, exploration or extraction of natural resources. However, there are some safeguards that the states must, must implement before development projects and are executed. So that was held the first time in the Saramaca versus Suriname case. Okay, the state must carry out, first of all, prior free and informed consultation with the indigenous people. Second, environmental and social impact assessment. And third, sharing the benefits of exploitation with the indigenous people. So regarding consultation, this must be performed before the exploitation is carried out and must be continued and update at different stage of the project. It's not like a photography, it's more like a, could, we could say a video. This should be done in good faith and with the objective of achieving agreement. It must be adequate and accessible and well informed for the indigenous community. The lack of consultation, the court has recognized that affect the human rights of cultural identity collective property and the right to participation. Specifically, in the Sarayaku and Kalinian Locono case, non-consultation was carried out. Regarding the second safeguard, shared benefits, the court has said that those are the benefits of the exploitation of indigenous territory as means of just compensation. In either case, have the indigenous people received compensation or benefits at all? Specifically in Caliña and Locono, the state argued that the benefits was to leave the road for extraction for the indigenous people. Of course, that was not accepted by the court as a form of compensation. The third requirement, environmental and social impact assessment, must be carried out by independent and technically capable entities. The authorities must supervise the study in question. So in both cases, Kalinia and Locono and Sarayaku, the ass these assessments were performed by private consultant for the company without any supervision by authorities and without participation of the indigenous people. But what is, it is very interesting in, in the jurisprudence of the court is that in Kalinia, the court considered that since the adverse impact of mining activities were caused by transnational corporation, the court took note of the guiding principles on business and human rights, which are endorsed by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, which establish that business must respect and protect human rights, as well as prevent, mitigate, and accept responsibility for the adverse human rights impacts directly linked to their activities. So the court also notes the recommendation of the special representative of the UN on issues on hu of human rights and transnational corporations and other business enterprise regarding international peoples. The court found that Suriname incurred in international responsibility because it didn't ensure prior assessment and didn't monitor and supervise it su subsequently. It held that the state had not adopted any mechanisms in order to guarantee these safeguards. So as a comprehensive reparations, the court ran more than seven different measures in each case that we don't have time to, to, to tell right now about it. But regarding the environmental degradation as rehabilitation measures, 
in Sarayaku, the court orders the state to neutralize and remove all explosives of the, on the surface and bury within the territory of the Sarayaku. In Caliña and Locono case, it, uh, the court orders to implement measures to rehabilitate the affected area in the Guana Creek Natural Reserve. Specifically, the state must draw an action plan in conjunction with the company and with the participation of the indigenous people. Second, create a mechanism to monitor and supervise the rehabilitation by the company and must appoint an expert in order to ensure a total compliance. This compliance, of course, is a state obligation, the court specified, that must be complete within three years and the state must provide an annual report to the court. In other words, even though the court only has jurisdiction over state actions or omissions, a state can be held liable for <coughs> failing to regulate and supervise the action of private corporations. <coughs> As a concluding remark, I would like to say that the Inter-American Court as the highest human rights authority in the region has held that consultation and the protection of the environment are rights for the indigenous people and obligations for the state. The state must guarantee collective access to justice to indigenous people for this end and not impunity in this area is allowed. In recent years, these standards have been adopted in legislation of many countries in the Americas. For instance, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Peru, Costa Rica is in process, and Mexico too. So I would like to share that the court's decision have also been taken into consideration by donor countries, like Norway, for instance, that have made compliance with these prerequisites for states receiving international corporations funds. We should listen today if the IDB and the World Bank are also considering the, those standards. In closing, no one here denies the potential benefits that development projects can bring to our societies. However, it is fundamental corporations and governments are extremely conscious of possible risks to human rights and environment that may be avoided through compliance from the beginnings with the national and international standards, which are already well developed in order to guarantee a sustainable present and future of our society and the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we're going to hear from Lisa or Chevron. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Lisa. Um, I'm going to structure my remarks around three key areas. First of all, I was asked to address what is Chevron's footprint in Latin America. So I want to talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about our framework, about how we as a company see our contribution to economic development. And then I'm going to talk specifically about our social investment portfolio in the Latin America region and give you a bit of a feel for how that's structured, some of the met high level metrics, and um, yeah, then look forward to a, a good discussion after that. So in terms of Chevron in Latin America, or just to take a step back, Chevron first, um, we are an international oil and gas company. We are the second largest American oil and gas company. We are based in California, but we are a truly global um, organization. About over 70% of our production comes from countries outside the US. We have operations across six continents, pretty significant ones in over 30 countries. Um, in terms of Latin America, our history goes back for nearly a century now. We began exploration activities in Venezuela and Colombia in the 1920s. And we now have exploration and production interests in four other countries, Argentina, Brazil, most recently Mexico, uh, and we also have some small interests in Suriname. In Colombia, we are uh, one of the largest producers of natural gas. In Venezuela, we're still one of the largest oil and gas companies, and we work very closely with PDVSA um, on our work there. In Argentina, and I'll talk a little bit more about our, our um, operations there, we are in 
uh, northern Patagonia in the southwest of the country. We have both conventional and unconventional oil and gas development, uh, meaning we, we're partnering right now. We have two projects with IPFE in the Vaca Muerta shale development region. In Brazil, it's all offshore. We have a uh, operated block. Uh, well, sorry, we're the operator. It's the Fraje field, and then we have uh, we work also with Petro, Petrobras, and we have a non-operated block, which is Tapatera. And where have I forgotten? Mexico. So Mexico. This is you know, uh, I, as a company, we're really excited about uh, the changes that we've um, seen there recently in the opening up of the sector. We this summer we had our first Chevron branded um, gas terminals open up. Um, and that's all on the west coast of the country. It's in Sinaloa, Sonora, Baja California, and Baja California Sur. But then on the other side, and on the upstream side, we, um, in December of last year, a Chevron-led um, consortium was awarded an offshore deep water block just off the coast of Tamaulipas, um, so very close to the border with the United States. And that's something that we are going to be working on. Um, we have teams currently re reviewing seismic data. We don't actually have any activity going on right now. But that's definitely, I, I imagine the company is going to keep bidding on a number of the blocks that are going to come up in Mexico. And that's it. So that's our footprint. In terms of how we look at development, I think it's very important to say, uh, just to build on some of the comments that came earlier, that we have decades of experience and data to show that our business is only going to be successful, meaning we're only going to get oil and gas resources out of the ground. We're only going to be able to provide affordable and reliable energy to people if we are doing that work in a way that contributes to progress um, and the prosperity of the people that we work with and the communities where we operate. You can't be in places for 80 years um, if you haven't, you know, built the relationships and um, thought about really carefully about how you are impacting local community lives. Um, and, and how we do that, our impact, um, we kind of look at it through three lenses. So first of all, in terms of dollar spend, right, just our presence in the region, the projects that we do, the goods and services that we require to be able to operate is, is tremendous. Um, our global spend on goods and services for the last eight years alone was probably, I think it's $370 billion. So those are some really, really big numbers. Um, and, and I think this was alluded to earlier, we, we may not be able to be hiring directly a large workforce because we're a capital intensive business, um, but we hire you know, lots of contractors and um, you know, our repercussions all the way down the supply chain are very significant. Um, so, you know, uh, we're also very often a lot of the countries we operate huge taxpayers. So the, the tax revenue base piece is, is, is huge. Um, so that's kind of our development, uh, uh, our, our business footprint and, and business spend. We also do social investments, which are our, our more voluntary contributions to the communities where we operate. The last eight years, the global spend has been, um, it's I think close to $2 billion now. Um, so just to give you a sense of that, um, but then I also really want to say that the last piece is not just about the money and how much money we spend where we go. It's really about how we do our business. Um, you know, the number one policy, policy one of our company is something called the Chevron way. And it goes into real details about getting the results the right way and what that means for us. Um, and there's very little interest in people who are going to work in ways that get great results but don't do it properly. Um, and the very first focus of that Chevron Way document is on people, uh, the environment, and safety. And we have an, a, zero, um, a zero incident expectation and goal, which is not, again, the same for all companies. Every, every project is designed in such a way that we want to have, we expect, there should be zero incidents. Of course, that's not always the case because of human error, most generally, that's the overwhelming factor. 
but there is a corporate wide expectation that everywhere we go, we are, you know, it's not acceptable to have a spill, no matter what size it is. It's not acceptable to have a fatality. Um, and we work very hard on that. Uh, that. That policy one also has a huge emphasis on integrity, anti-corruption, two-way dialogue with all stakeholders. It's now a requirement to have plans on how you're going to engage with different straight stakeholders for every single business unit. Um, we've done a lot of guidance so far on grievance mechanisms, and we do a lot around operational um, grievance mechanisms. That's also something that we're working into. How do we build that into our, our, our expectations around two-way dialogue? Um, and that's an area I've worked on quite a lot directly because of um, my work on business and human rights. So I'll end by just talking quickly about business and human rights and say, you know, we have a human rights policy. Um, we talk about the fact that we, uh, we, we believe that you, you have to respect human rights. Um, you have to understand what that means as a company. Uh, we reference the UN guiding principles on business and human rights in our, in our, um, in our comments on that, in our guidance on that. Um, so that that's something that's really important. I'm running out of time, um, but just to mention very, very quickly what our social investment portfolio looks like in Latin America it's, um, and how we structure that and how we approach that. It's pretty diverse because the region is very diverse. Uh, our general approach is we come into an area and we do a needs assessment, first of all, to look at what are the community needs. We then do a partnership mapping to see who are the potential partners out there. There's always a big focus on local government because we, need, we know that our, our projects are most sustainable when they're actually aligned with the development plans that the government has in place. So that's a big focus for us. Um, and uh, so it's normally a, a mixture of where are, the where are the needs, where are the opportunities, and we, we really hate to do anything by ourselves uh, because we know that that's just not gonna be sustainable. So most of our programs are with local government, are with nonprofit partners, are with community groups for that reason. I don't have 2016 data because you know there's always like a data lag in terms of being able to measure impact in numbers, but uh, in the region we had 2 million beneficiaries between 2012 and 2015. That was for 62 <laughs> projects with over 64 implementing partners, just to give you a feel. 40% of the spend was in education, 25% of the spend was on economic development, and 20% uh, was on health. And that tends to be, you know, what that looks like at the country level is gonna, again, totally depend on um, not only national priorities, but where we are specifically operating. But those are always our key focus areas is health, education, and economic development. Health, because if you don't have that, it's foundational, right? It's hard to do anything else. Education, because the returns, you're all here, are huge, right? It's something that if you invest in, no one can take it away from you for the rest of your life. Um, it's hard to measure some of the returns on education sometimes, but it's, it's uh, obviously a, a big priority area for us, 40% of spend. And then economic development, which is my particular area and focus of expertise, uh, which is all about job creation and, and entrepreneurship. Um, it can be some of the most challenging projects to get right, um, but it's definitely an area that we've got a lot of lessons learned as a company. And I guess I will stop there. Thank you. Now we're going to... Last but not least, Ramon. <clears throat> uh, Australia, Chile, Norway, and Peru show a number of uh, similar economic features. For the four countries, the 10 first exports in revenue are primary goods. Uh, for the, the share of uh, exports, or exports as a share of GDP, is exactly the same in Norway and Chile, it's 15%, and in Australia and Peru, it's 10%. Primary exports as a share of total exports is roughly the same in the four countries, between 60 and 65%. However, the similarities in the economic realm stop there. Export revenue per capita in Australia and Norway is sixfold that of uh, Peru and Chile. PIB per capita, no, GDP per capita uh, of Australia and Norway is uh, ninefold that of Peru and Chile. 
what these differences tell us. First, that there is a more, much more intensive exploitation of natural resources in Norway and Australia than uh, there is in Peru and Chile. The Australia and Norway don't care much about the exhaustion of their natural resources. There is a much higher productivity in the exploitation of these natural resources in Australia and Norway than there is in Chile and Peru. And there is a much higher integration of these extractive industries, in the case of Norway, oil and gas, in the case of Australia, all of them. It, th these industries are much more integrated into the economic and social tissue of their respective countries than it is in the cases of Chile and Peru. Why of these differences? And if I had to coin it in a single word, uh, extractive industries in developed economies are accepted, are generally accepted as a natural vote industry in these countries. And diversification and integration into those economies come as a natural process. The first export good in Finland is timber. The second is wood processing machinery, a natural diversification of their natural comparative advantage. Nokia is a spin-off of a timber processing plant in Finland. They needed uh, out of the telecommunications department, Nokia was born. Uh, the first export in Norway is oil and gas. The second largest is hydrocarbon engineering services. In the case of Australia, they export everything. They export first by far largest exporters of iron ore, copper. They export oil and gas, etc. But they also export large uh, mining companies. BHP, Billiton, Rio Tinto are Australian uh, companies. These countries don't suffer of shocks when there are sudden changes in the price of commodities. They have well-established savings and stabilization funds. And there is a much better and sustained relationship between the three stakeholders between civil society, um, industry, and government in these uh, countries. What is different in Latin America? What has been historically different in the development of the, these extractive industries in Latin America? And again, if I had to coin it in a single word, it would be rejection, as there is acceptance in the developed countries, there is rejection for this kind of industries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this antagonistic relationship goes back to colonial times, where these countries were born under all the Spanish colon or the Iberic colonization took place, e exploiting uh, all, uh, gold and silver, etc. Then, well until the end, of last century, some 20 years ago, these industries were perceived as a foreign enclave, which they were, not integrated into the country. A curse, we talk about the resource curse in Latin America, they don't talk about the resource curse in Norway or Finland or Sweden or Australia or Canada or the US. It is not a curse, it's a blessing. Why couldn't it be a blessing in Latin America? But we refer to it as La maldición de los recursos uh, naturales. We have historically perceived uh, these industries just as a source of rent for developing the non-extractive sector. We perceived ourselves all along the last century as agriculture countries that unfortunately discovered oil. And then uh, as the extractive industries were perceived to be short-lived, uh, we had to extract as much rent as possible to develop the, the true local uh, sector, which was the agricultural sector. And there is no better uh, phrase that synthesizes this strategy that saw in the oil, coined by Sembrar el Petróleo, coined by Ursula Pietri in, 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 in Venezuela. 
However, this perception has been changing. I would say that it lasted until my, my generation, or perhaps the generation of younger people like Angelo Rivero. But this changing has been changing for the last three decades. And now we perceive this perception of this antagonistic relationship, and this is important, led to uh, several processes of expropriation. Oil industry was expropriated in Mexico in the 1930s. The extractive industries were expropriated in Chile, Peru, and Venezuela in the 1970s. But things began to change. Chile, allow, um, Brazil allowed for direct private investment in the 1997 reform of Fernando Enrique Cardoso. The same happened in Colombia when they opened in 2005. And the most revealing example of this is the most nationalistic country in Latin America, Mexico, through an amazing process that implied changing the constitution and approving this reform in all federal states, changed the, the oil and electricity, or hydrocarbons and electricity framework to allow the direct private participation. Things are changing. And we're developing a new narrative in Latin America, which is not, it's not us, it's the region. Us as expression of the region are changing that narrative. In Chile, which is taking the lead in this process of integrating these industries into their economic sector and, and social uh, uh, tissue, they talk about an industry that is virtuous, the industry, an industry that creates industries inclusive in terms of social inclusion and sustainable in terms of social and environmental sustainability. And this is what we want to do at the IDB, what we're doing at the IDB. I lead at the IDB a pretty young uh, initiative on extractive industries, and we see in a, a, a process of consultation with the stakeholders, with uh, industry, civil society, and governments, that we can play three roles, and we're playing three roles. One is that of goodwill broker among the three antagonistic stakeholders. The, the, the essence of the relationship is antagonistic. But you can play a win-win a win -win game in this if you bring together society, industry, and, and government. Then the IDB can play uh, the role of goodwill broker. The second as a development strat uh, institution, we can promote uh, a strategic long-term view for the sector at the regional level, at the national level, help the countries to develop uh, an inclusive uh, and, and positive perspective at the national level, at the regional level, and at the local mine level. And third, we can be a partner for, as, as a bank, we can be a partner for responsible uh, investment. This is ba based in three features that the bank has built all along 60 years of existence. One is the presence. We're present in all countries, in all 26 countries in Latin America and Caribbean with uh, uh, local offices, but which are much larger, taken together than the bank in Washington. We have a reputation, a good, well-gained and hard-to-win reputation in the region and we have the, the resources. Then, we're prepared to play this uh, role. Our initiative is pretty young, and we're working at present at, at a very detailed level in, in uh, uh, Peru, Colombia, and to surprise you all, to surprise you all in Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is not just uh, merengue, uh, baseball players, and uh, beautiful beaches, it they also have the largest, the third largest gold mine on, on Earth. And we're developing, together with Natasha and a number of colleagues, Angel Macef, that is here, it's nine of us all together, developing 15 technical cooperations in Latin America looking at the, into the sector. I will finish with a, a thought. It took the IDB 57 years to realize uh, how important these industries are in Latin America. In, and the reason for that, that was the, the IDB is an expression of, in the last instance, of uh, Latin America. And it expressed not doing extractives, maintaining uh, extractives out of the mainstream of the bank, 
it was an expression of this rejection for these uh, industries. It took us 57 years, I hope, because I would like to be there, it not takes 57 more years to, to integrate fully this uh, uh, sector. The most important sector, and I want to highlight uh, the, the numbers that Natasha used at the beginning of his, her presentation, uh, highlight the importance of this sector, which is the backbone of, of Latin America and Caribbean. It's by far the most important economic sector in Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, and, and Mexico, and in some Central American and Caribbean countries. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our four panelists. Because of how we're doing with time, I would like to open up the floor for questions. There are microphones in both aisles. If you could line up and ask whatever questions you might have. <coughs> My name is Alejandro Gonzalez. I am an MPM student. Thanks for coming. It has been a really interesting panel. So my question is, the next year, uh, many countries in Latin America, such as the case of Mexico, we're going to have presidential elections, which means that probably many decisions that have been made uh, could uh, have a setback or rollback. Uh, in that sense, how this scenario uh, would affect investments and policies or projects that even the private sector of the multilateral organizations are uh, developed for those countries. Thank, Thank you, Alexander. Should we take a couple of questions and then you answer what mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Thomas Seeger. I'm an alumnus of the School of Foreign Service. My question is a gentleman from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. You mentioned large companies and how they can have an impact on human rights of large extractive industries, companies, but there's also the phenomenon of artisanal mining and illegal uh, logging, and how can a court like that, like the American Court of Human Rights, address some of these smaller scale actors? Good morning, my name is Rafael Corral, I'm a former McCourt School student. Uh, my question is mostly for Jorge. Um, what is your opinion on this, on what Ramon mentioned about this new narrative in Latin America of it being possible to have a responsible and socially and environmentally sustainable extractive industry? Does that, how, how does that um, relate to the human rights vision for, 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 for the region? Take one more right now, we'll answer, and then if someone else has more questions. Great. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, John Jordan from the Global Human Development Program. And I was hoping you could speak about the influence of Chinese investment in the extractive industry in Latin America. Thank you. So, could we start with the first question that we had about the effects of elections coming up in the region and the in the industry? Sure, I'm happy to answer that briefly. Um, so we're very aware of it. We're monitoring it. We're looking at Mexico very closely, for example. Um, but I think that that's a good example, too, where our own elections have consequences that we're still also working through. Um, so, you know, for example, there's a lot of resources right now being devoted to uh, understanding what's going on with the NAFTA renegotiation. Uh, which would have huge implications for our company and our ambitions in Mexico. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's something that, that would potentially affect things pretty, pretty significantly. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's too early to tell uh, what the results will be. Um, I think also more conceptually, and, and I think this is related to the cultural change that I that I mentioned that I that I referred to. Um, 
if it is going, if, if extractive industries, uh, if extractive activity is going to lead to sustainable development, to inclusive sustainable development, it must be thought of and planned upon from a, a long term perspective as a politica de Estado instead of government uh, policy. Because extractive investments, they're huge, it's very capital intensive, it, it, is, it is a long term activity, and communities will be there um, impacted negatively, positively, whatever way, by this activity for a very, very, very long time. And governments naturally have a short, uh, a short political cycle. So this is part of the balance that has to be achieved if we are going to, to promote development, I think. And, and, and we are, I, I remain optimistic, regardless of, of, of the elections, that, and, and this is a, a sine qua non condition, especially for the industry, I'm sure Chevron will agree, that there needs to be a minimum uh, regulatory and, and, and legal stability and, and conditions in place for it to facilitate and promote these investments which are the ones that are going to generate the wealth that we are talking about. So. I would like to build on what Natasha just, upon what Natasha just said. There are at least three countries that have uh, 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 elections next year, and the three of them, they are based on extractive industries. These countries are Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. And uh, Brazil. <laughs> in Chile, there is no this. I mean, what what's going to happen with the extractives is very different in the three countries, and the perception of the election process changing these policies in Chile is much more internalized. I mean, there is, they, they have no doubt. Uh, across the board, that the future lies on on, uh, on producing more copper, not less copper, and integrating the copper industry into the, into the Chilean economy. So then, uh, regardless of who wins, it will continue. There is that is not an issue. That's not an issue. In Colombia, I would say the same. All candidates are very much aware of the importance of the oil, gas, and, and gold industries, and, and the potential of the mining sector in Colombia. Even in the case of Mexico, I, I, I think that López Obrador understands this, the importance of the reform. And I, I, that remains to be seen, and it will be a good test for the Mexican Political sector and the economic and the Mexican uh, society so is going to be reversed. My impression is that it will not, even the, in the in that uh, case, because at this moment everyone realizes how how damaging that 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 uh, that that could be. Let's wait and see. But the point I want to make is this: as much as these sectors are may normal sectors. The, the rejection will be more or less. Um, I'm going to move on to the question about the government's narrative. Um, once again, they asked you first, but I would also like to hear um, from Lisa, if that's okay, about the narrative happening in Latin America regarding the production industry. So, Okay, uh, well, regarding this narrative, uh, I think, what, as I mentioned, uh, the inter-American or the human rights system have recognized that development projects are allowed under international law. And they are okay, they are useful, and they bring many benefits for societies. But the point is, for human rights approach, that there are some safeguards that must be achieved. And as long as those safeguards are guaranteed, uh, development projects are sustainable for, in, in specifically for, for indigenous people's communities. So I would say that 
yeah, this, this uh, new narrative is uh, compatible with the human rights approach as long as uh, take really care about uh, these uh, international standards. I guess just to build on that, I think it's really encouraging um, to hear directly, especially from the IDB, because you have such a perspective on the entire region um, of changes to the narrative. Uh, I think as a as a company, I I would say this is a very important factor. Um, I think that it, not to be underestimated, this determines as we look globally where we want to go. Obviously, we look at the geology. Uh, that determines hugely, but we've also learned, especially we were recently in Eastern Europe and other places, that if the political climate is not um, going to work for us, and if we, you know, it, it, development, long-term development is just not going to be possible. And I would say our presence <coughs> and our footprint would be much larger in Latin America if there was more sense of openness and acceptance. So I think we've done well in the companies where we have long histories. I think Colombia is a really good example um, of that. But if, uh, you know, I think it's a very positive thing for the region. And I think you want multinational, international companies that have human rights policies, right? Those are the, those are the operators that you want. You want the operators that have the zero incident policies in place um, and that have shareholders that will be filing some pretty strong shareholder resolutions about asking questions and, and holding the board accountable So um, to their performances in different regions. We get a lot of shareholder interest, for example, in what we're doing in Myanmar and other places that are considered highly sensitive. And we respond to that and we take that very seriously as a company. So I hope it's going to continue. Thank you. Yeah, there was an... Um, I'm going to actually go back to this question right now. They asked about artisan mining and illegal mining and how the Inter-American Court can sort of take steps to deal with this beyond. Yeah, I, what I understood is that you are focused on uh, small industries, right? So most of the cases that the Inter-American Court has dealt, dealt uh, are related with big companies. But of course, uh, those standards of consultations are applying for every activity that could affect indigenous people's territory. So according to UN uh, Labor Organization, the Convention 169, the, Amer the Universal Dec Declaration of the Indigenous People from UN and other international treaties and the corpus juris and different standards, all establish the, the important fact that it, the, the consultation is a right for indigenous people in every aspect that could affect their cosmovision, their territory, their culture, their spirituality, etc. So logging, legal, illegal, um, mining, etc., must pass through a consultation process, and even though it's a small industry. And we, uh, there is a other big debate related with a big uh, projects that the standard is sometimes could be higher, not just consultation, but consent by indigenous peoples. But this is a, a different discussion. But of course, it applies. If I may, if I may, if I may comment that um, the, I was in a, in a meeting with the Pacific Alliance countries, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, uh, and Chile. And, um, and the topic was ASM, artisanal, artisanal small scale mining. And there was a move, again, remember the changes are very slow, but, but they're happening, um, that to deal to approach artisanal, informal, illegal mining, which is a whole different ballpark, um, <coughs> from a social perspective, from this human right, with, with the human rights approach as well, not only as a mining industry thing, because the issues are far more complex, and, and what that means for the societies, because most of this artisanal, traditional, informal, historically have different names for it, but it also complicates the thing, but, but that it's usually um, subsistence, subsistence activity. So you have to see it from a, from a broader social, political, cultural perspective than just an industry mining, extracting the thing. So I think that, 
that's the idea. And the final question, for now, the final question was about the influence of China in extractive industry. That's the easy question. <laughs> A much larger scale, it's, uh, it's similar in the case of uh, China. Um, it is true that the presence of China in, in Latin American extractive sector has been uh, very intrusive and uh, disrespectful of uh, basic social and environmental uh, norms and rights. However, there are changes. I mean, I, my colleagues, Angel in the back there, and Natasha know better the case of Las Bambas in Peru, where uh, a Chinese company that took over that mine a few years ago mm -hmm. had to come to terms with the best practices in terms of relating to society and uh, fulfilling basic environmental standards. And that's the only way forward. Then, and one point I want to stress in all this is this is not just an issue of government. It's an issue of industry themselves, and we have better and worse practices, but it's an issue of civil society. And civil society has been empowered for good in Latin America. I mean, nothing will happen without the, the okay of, of the free stakeholders. Uh, uh, I would believe, as different from the past, the three are on the same uh, on the same footing. Then, uh, uh, civil society will demand uh, the rights, uh, or uh, extractive activities will not happen. Latin America, in that regard, has changed for good. I would say. Then, uh, in the past, was. Uh, Minería con tanque. Now it's uh, minería with uh, the other one. Eh? And otherwise, you will not have minería. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, I think we're out of time. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, stay for the next panel. I want to thank our panelists. We have some gifts for you.